In the year 1952, the demon lord Claudine led his four generals to fight against the kingdom of Catalan, located in the northern part of the central continent. The battle went on for seven long days, and the only person who managed to defeat the demon lord was the great hero called Jed Daubin. Jed, Zed, whatever you want to call him. At the beginning of it all, Jed calmly entered the room of the demon king. The great and powerful enemy welcomed him with a smile on his face. The dark lord was sitting comfortably on his throne. He even seemed to be waiting for our protagonist. He immediately asked our protagonist why he was alone alone, thinking that perhaps his friends had abandoned him. However, Jed picks up his sword and attacks the demon lord. The enemy blocks his attack and conjures up several magic circles to attack Jed. However, Jed dodges easily. He continues to launch magical attacks at Jed, but he dodges them all with ease. Our protagonist then runs towards him and drops the staff in his hand. But the demon lord leaps into the air and grabs it back. He uses the momentum to hit the ground. After this little confrontation, the demon lord is impressed by Jed's skill and asks him to join his army. However, our protagonist refuses, and the demon lord tells him that fighting for humanity won't benefit him and that all his friends are gone. However, according to Jed, he came there alone. Besides, he's not fighting for the good of humanity. His goal is to rescue the treasure and the princess he has. On hearing this, the demon lord is surprised. After all, the great hero's dream is to become a rich man and marry a princess. And ever since a man told him that he could become rich and marry a great, beautiful princess, as long as he defeated the demon lord, Jed has been striving for this. With this goal in mind, Jed spent all the money he had and embarked on a journey to become a hero. In response to all this, the demon lord tells our protagonist that he is fighting for a strange reason and tells him to surrender. However, our protagonist tells the demon lord that he has heard that the princess is very beautiful, and the demon lord wonders if Jed is really a hero. Jed stands in front of the demon king grinning like a maniac, thinking about how the princess will fall in love with him when he finally rescues her. This thought ends up giving our protagonist even more motivation to fight the demon king, and with his courage renewed, Jed attacks the demon lord again and defeats him with a quick, dry, empty blow, schling. In the end, Jed blurs his sword, saying that the power of dreams can make someone very powerful. In the end, the demon king's staff rolls up to him, and our protagonist picks it up. He opens a magic pouch and keeps the staff inside. Soon afterwards, Jed gets so excited about rescuing the princess that he literally runs at lightning speed to the prison where she is. He opens the door to the place, complimenting the princess on her beauty, but then he realizes that the person isn't female. Basically, it wasn't the Catalan princess who was captured, but the prince, and now Jed is completely heartbroken. The prince walks over to Jed, but he stumbles and falls into the arms of our protagonist in a completely romantic scene. They share this sweet moment together, and the prince tells Jed that he will be rewarded. Then Jed's imagination kicks in, and he doesn't like what he's imagined, so he turns away from the prince, saying that he doesn't care about the reward because he did it for the king. Soon afterwards, he takes a transportation scroll out of his magic bag and hands it to the prince. Once this is done, Jed takes takes another scroll and teleports away from the prince. After Jed has gone, the prince looks at the teleportation scroll and smiles sinisterly. Jed, on the other hand, teleports back to his room drenched in sweat. He's exhausted from the battle, but his anger knows no bounds. He wonders where the beautiful and wonderful princess is and why the demon lord kidnapped the prince instead of a princess. He is sad that his dream didn't come true, but what consoles him is the fact that he managed to defeat the demon lord. Suddenly, a video game disc glows and Jed feels the urge to play. Meanwhile, the prince returns to the castle, and the guards are shocked to see him. He enters the throne room, and his sister and the king welcome him. He tells his story, and his father asks him how he is, and the prince tells him not to worry, because he's fine. He tells the king that he's discovered something interesting. Meanwhile, Jed is playing video games and doing everything in his power to protect the princess and embark on a path to becoming a hero. Then we see that on a rainy night, a village is being attacked. The attacker enters, and young Jaina is in her house and clings to her mother for protection. The assailants stand over her and look at her with malice. Young Jaina manages to escape, but her mother is not so lucky. Jaina runs, crossing the village to try to get to safety, but she stumbles and falls, losing the will to live. Then the demon king gives her a hood to protect her from the rain and offers her his hand. She accepts, and he takes her to his castle to keep her safe. Upon arriving at the castle, the girl is finally happy to be safe, but suddenly the demon king disintegrates. Jaina looks at the spot where he was standing with tears in her eyes, and in the end, Jaina herself wakes up panting, and she quickly pulls a knife out of the picture of Jed that hangs on her wall. She's much older now, and it was all just a realistic dream. She sits up and vows to get revenge on Jed. Basically, a while ago, Claudine's four knights helped the Demon King conquer and rule the North. Jaina was one of them, and during the battle against the Kingdom of Catalan, they were defeated one after the other by Jed. After the defeat, each of them moved on, but Jaina hid her identity and went to the Kingdom of Catalan to avenge the death of the Demon Lord. Jaina prepares to leave her room at the inn. She looks at Jed's photo with disdain, promising to find him and avenge Lord Claudine. However, before
before she can do that, she has to get down to some work in a coffee shop. Jaina puts on her work clothes, and all the customers in the store are thrilled to have such a beautiful person attending to them. They give her their orders, and she writes them down. Basically, she's been working in this coffee shop for three months, and her aim was to gather information about Jed, and as time went by, she ended up being captivated by her colleagues and the customers. She remembers how she found herself in such a difficult situation when she was walking around town one day until she came across Lord Claudine's staff in a pawn shop. She stopped outside the store and looked through the glass to make sure that this is indeed the genuine piece, and after careful inspection, she is convinced that this is the real thing. She wonders why Lord Claudine's gun is in a pawn shop. Then she looks at the price tag and can't believe the value. She looks at her handful of coins, but unfortunately, that won't be enough to buy the staff. Jaina is sure that this staff will be high in the future, so she decides to find a way to get it, without compromising her disguise. She looks back and sees a line of people outside the coffee shop. The cafe has a hiring sign, and Jaina decides to apply for the job. So we're back to the present day, where Jaina is putting ketchup on some rice and wondering why she hasn't heard a word about Jed, or the great hero since she arrived in town. She thinks he must be being protected by someone very powerful, and out of nowhere, Jed walks into the store and a waiter greets him. Jaina is quickly given the task of serving Jed at his table. She goes over and greets Jed, and just as she's about to ask him what he wants, she realizes that the hero is standing in front of her. She calls him by his name, and he greets her casually. She wonders how he found her, and also wonders if he intends to take her down once and for all. She quickly concludes that he would have if he wanted to, and decides to try to find out what's going on. In the end, Jed was just there to have a coffee and enjoy the beautiful cosplayers, and since Jed doesn't recognize Jaina, he is embarrassed by her beauty, praising the place as if it were the best coffee shop in Catalan. Jaina asks him what he would like to order, and he asks for a standard meal. She accepts his order, surprised that he has come to the cafe just to eat. However, Jaina still thinks he has another ulterior motive. Then Jed says he's heard that the cafeteria provides other services, and she gets apprehensive, calling him a pervert. Then he tells her that the cafeteria management has said that customers can take pictures with the waitresses if they ask to go for a set meal. Just then, Jaina's boss arrives, scolds her, and apologizes to Jed for the treatment he received. She takes them both to the photo booth and takes a picture of him. Jed is satisfied with the service, and Jaina is surprised that he didn't recognize her. Meanwhile, a spy peers through the window, looking at Jed as he passes. He looks at a photo of Jed and Jaina that he took while Jed was ordering a meal at the cafe. The spy from the Kingdom of Catalan runs out into an alley, and he's moving too quickly not to be caught. On his way, the Catalan spy bumps into another spy and wonders if he is a member of a different group. The other spy runs out of the alley and stops in front of a lady. The woman asks him what he wants, and he simply dresses her up in some magical girl clothes. The woman is immediately embarrassed and tries to hide. However, the spy does the same thing with the other girls who were standing next to him, and they all call him a pervert. The guy takes a photo of the women in their new outfits, and the Catalan spy wonders if the other spy is really an undercover spy for the king. Together, the girls there and start beating up the pervert. The Catalan spy soon realizes that the other spy's activity is not easy at all, as the women have no mercy on him. Just then, the spy's hood falls off, and the Catalan spy recognizes him as Pag, one of the Demon King's four horsemen. Pag is an experienced photographer who is obsessed with magical girls, and during the Battle of the Kingdoms, he defeated Catalan's Order of Female Rose Knights single-handedly, and made a point of tacking several photos of them in their new outfits. After the defeat of the Demon King and the conclusion of the war, Pag published the Order of the Roses album. Maria, the captain of the Order of the Roses, was not happy to see the publication, and she vowed to punish Pag for his insolence. She looks at her desk with a pile of letters from her fans, and wonders why she's receiving all this. Then her assistant enters her office, bringing more fan letters, leaving Maria even more surprised. So she goes to the window and makes a silent vow, promising to tear Pag to pieces when she finds him. Coincidentally, when she looks down, she sees Pag running past her window, and he is being chased by several women. Maria is surprised to see Pag in town, while Jed is sitting there, framing the photo he took in the coffee shop with Jaina. He then puts it on a stand in his living room. Out of nowhere, someone knocks on the front door, and Jed goes to open it. He sees Pag standing outside, completely drenched in sweat. He greets Jed, saying he hasn't seen him for a long time, and Jed isn't happy to see Pag, and tries to shut the door in his face, but Pag holds the door. He begs Jed to let him in, so that he can hide for a while and escape from the Catalan people who are chasing him. At this point, Jed asks him why he always looks for him when he's on the run, and Pag tells him that this is what friends do. Pag begs Jed to stop being mean and let him in. However, our protagonist tells Pag that he doesn't consider him a friend, because Pag is one of the four great demons. On hearing this, Pag falls dejectedly to the ground. They looked very dejected by this comment. In the end, Jed agrees to let Pag in. However, Jed tells him that they are enemies, and that he can't keep using the friend excuse to stay in his house. Continuing his lines, Jed tells Pag to take a shower before going to bed, since he's been on the run all day. He also says that there's enough food in the
in the fridge, and that they could play video games together later. And continuing, the hero tells Pag to let him know if he needs anything, all so that he can buy it before the store closes. He tells Pag not to touch his things, and Pag tells him that he just wants to have a look. During his look around, Pag notices the photo Jed took with Jaina in the cafeteria and is surprised. He asks Jed why he took a picture with Jaina, and Jed finally realizes that the cosplayer in the cafeteria was one of the four great demons. Then we see the spy returning to the castle, handing the photos to the king, and now the king is furious that the great hero has contact with the four great demons. He asks the spy where he saw him, and the spy tells him that he took the photos while following Jed. The king asks the spy who gave him the order to follow Jed, and he tells the king that the prince gave him the order. The king wonders if the prince is trying to trick them in order to punish the hero, but the chief minister starts accusing Jed of colluding with the demon lord. The minister tells the king to take action, and the king issues an order for Jed, Pag, and Jaina to be captured. He then says that one of the four great demons, Rock, will be executed the next day. Just then, the prince descends into the dungeon, holding a lantern and wearing a disguise. The two guards on duty notice him, but don't recognize him and ask him his identity. He releases the lantern and then knocks out the guards. Soon afterwards, he goes to the cage where Rock was and finds him chained to the walls. He tells him that it's been time since they last spoke, and then tells Rock that he heard he would be executed the next day. Rock immediately recognizes the prince and asks what he's doing in the dungeon. The prince takes off his disguise and asks Rock not to be so cold to him. He tells Rock that he can facilitate his escape and help him rebuild the Demon Lord's army, even having the initial idea of being taken hostage if Rock wants. However, Rock says there's not much he can do because the battle is over and he's failed. On hearing this, the prince steps through the bars of the stone prison and approaches him. He asks Rock if he has forgotten the promise he made to his lord, and Rock tells him that Claudine is dead and that he can't do anything on his own. After receiving this answer, the prince tells him that he will find the solution without him and says goodbye. So the prince leaves the cell, calling Rock Lord Invictus instead of Rock. Rock, on the other hand, stayed there feeling sick about Mr. Claudine's death. Meanwhile, Jed and Peggy were playing video games in Jed's apartment. Then Jed asks Peggy if there is a person called Lord Invictus with green hair among the knights of the Demon Lord's army, and Peggy tells Jed that his name is Rock. He tells Jed that Rock is the eldest son of an incredibly powerful family of swordsmen. He tells Jed that rumor has it that Rock has a younger sister who is even much stronger than he is. He tells Jed that he once fought Rock, and the experience was very frightening. Jed asks Peggy why Rock joined the Demon Lord's team, and Peggy tells him he's not sure, but thinks it has something to do with the legend of the Kingdom of Catalan. He tells Jed that it's the legend of the Black Dragon of Altoro, and Jed thinks so too. This legend says that when twins are born in the Kingdom of Catalan, one of them must be sacrificed to the Black Dragon of Altaro in exchange for his eternal protection, and Jed thinks it's best not to check the authenticity of this legend. After all, since the end of the war, he has felt a strange magic emanating from the royal capital. He thinks there's something wrong with this country, and at that moment, he lost at the video game, because Jed wasn't paying attention to him. So Peggy relaxes and breathes a sigh of relief, and he tells Jed that he's not so bad. Jed gets up from the sofa and tells Peggy that he's going to buy some food, even though he already has some at home. He asks Peggy if he'd like anything, and Peggy tells him he wants fries, Coke, KFC, iFood. He also tells him that he needs chicken, pizza, and some women. But Jed tells him that all this is a bit impossible. Our protagonist begins to lose patience, and Peggy tells him to buy the new issue of a weekly manga and a cup of milky milk. In response to these requests, Jed asks Peggy if he is his servant or something, and asks Peggy to understand that they are enemies. And upon hearing this, Peggy apologizes to him. Suddenly, the door to Jed's apartment is broken down. The burglar points her sword at Jed and tells him that she will remove Jed's head and avenge the demon lord Claudine, and she quickly notices Peggy in the apartment. What's worse, Peggy and Jed are in a rather suspicious position, so she asks what they're doing, and Peggy tells her not to get the wrong idea. He tells her that he's a friend of Jed's, and that he's just staying at his house for a few days. Jaina then asks Peggy if he was the one who let Jed into the castle during the battle, and Jed confirms this to her, but Peggy tells her that Jed is lying. He says he was sloppy that day because he was the only one at the gate of the Demon Lord's castle. Then he tells her what happened. That day, Jed disguised himself as a delivery man and handed the latest edition of a manga to Peggy, and because Peggy was distracted by the manga, Jed knocked him over. On hearing this, Jaina is disappointed in him. She tells him that he's too weak and that it's pointless for him to stand guard since he can't even defend a gate. She turns to Jed and tells him that she will do the right thing, which is to avenge him. She takes another knife out of her pocket and runs towards Jed with malicious intent. Jaina tells Jed that this will be his last day on Earth and attacks him with her sword, but he moves out of the way. She cuts the sofa in two, and without letting him and Peggy get hurt, Jed stands up. He tells Jaina to calm down because she's basically fighting for nothing since the war is over. He tells her that he's no longer a hero and that he doesn't want to be her enemy. She looks at him sternly and tells him to stop talking. She attacks him again, swinging her sword towards his head, 
but he moves quickly and misses her, only to be continually attacked by her. She lands a big blow, but Jed crouches and she misses. She tries to hit him while crouching, but he jumps over her and falls behind her. His feet barely touch the ground before she throws a dagger at him. He dodges, and suddenly a voice calls out to him from behind. He sees that the dagger is heading for an Actian figure from his collection. At that moment, our protagonist embodies the Flash and rushes to save his beloved piece. He catches the blade before it hits the piece, and Jaina is surprised at how quickly he moves. He asks her if no one has told her so as not to touch other people's collections. That said, he throws the dagger back at her, and she blocks it with her sword, but the blade of her sword breaks in the process, and she is thrown back by the force of the impact, and Jed immediately decreases the distance between them. He stands before her, with a menacing aura covering every inch of his body. She looks at him, fearing for her life, and quickly steps back to try to create some distance, throwing gestures from her broken sword, and then taking five daggers from her belt, she places them between her fingers to transform herself into Wolverine. She runs towards Jed, who calmly places his finger in a moving position, and Jaina becomes apprehensive. She jumps behind him and tries to attack him from behind, but he notices and adjusts the direction of his fingers. Jaina throws her daggers at Jed, but he strikes with his fingers several times, destroying the daggers. Jaina desperately picks up her broken sword and attacks Jed, but he simply dodges the attack and kicks her to the ground. In the end, he throws the broken sword, which sticks in the wall near Jaina's ear. At this point, Jaina loses the will to fight and asks Jed if he really is a hero. Our protagonist then asks her if she knows how Lord Claudine died, before deciding to come and avenge his death. She tells him that our protagonist probably shot him in the back. However, he tells her that Lord Claudine and he fought at full strength, with both dreams and dignity at stake. He asks her if she is also ready to meet her end, since she went all that way to finish him off. He picks up the broken sword from the wall, and Jaina accepts her fate. But Jed throws the sword on the floor. He says that the night he defeated Claudine was the end of the battle. He tells her that there is no need for anyone to die after the end of the war. This triggers a memory in which Claudine tells her that he hopes no one dies in this war. Jaina starts to shed tears, and Pag scolds Jed for making a girl cry. Jed tells Pag that he thinks he meant well, but he still apologizes to Jaina. He tells her that if she really wanted revenge, he can let her hit him without them fighting back. Jed will allow her to do this on the condition that she ends her quest for revenge right there. So Jaina wipes away her tears, stands up, clenches her fist, and prepares to hit him. Jed said he wouldn't hit back, but he put up an invisible shield to protect himself. However, Jaina throws a punch that penetrates his shield, and he is thrown against the wall, and Jaina then says that she is just taking a break from her revenge, and promises Jed that one day she will kill him. Suddenly, Jed's mental alarm goes off, and he tells the others that they are all surrounded. He looks through the window blinds and sees hundreds of soldiers standing outside the apartment complex. He realizes that the soldiers are the king's men, and concludes that they are not there for him. He looks at Jaina, but tells her that his cover has not been blown. Then Jed looks at Pag, and Pag gets scared. So our protagonist's idea now is to hand Pag over to the soldiers. Jaina agrees, and they both nod, smiling at each other. Outside, the commander of the soldiers tells the Archmage of Catalan that Jed is in front of the apartment complex, and smile. And now the whole area has been evacuated, so the wizard can get right down to it with his hard, thick attacks. They were just waiting for an order to attack, and Jed's ingenious idea to escape this situation was to leave his apartment with Pag's hands tied and tell everyone that he had helped capture one of the four great demons. However, everyone is ordered not only to capture Pag, but also Jed and Jaina, because the hero is no longer a trustworthy man, and the king has ordered his execution. Jed tries to explain himself, but he is attacked by an infinite anti-gravity spell before he can finish his speech. The great wizard boasts about his magic and tells Jed to explain himself to the judge, tired of trying to talk. Jed casts a reversal spell that nullifies the enemy's magic and throws it at the wizard and his soldier. The enemies are surprised that Jed can use such high-level magic, even though he is only a swordsman. So Jed tells everyone that he was never a swordsman, he just uses a sword because he thinks he is a swordsman. It makes him look really cool. Then the enemy wizard interrupts his spell and tells the soldiers on the ground to disperse. He then orders a second unit, located on the rooftops, to launch their attacks. The Jedi looks at the unit and louses his motivation to fight. So, he takes his only option, he grabs Jaina and Pag, and together they flee. Jaina asks him why the soldiers are after him too, and he tells her it's because the knights must have discovered that Pag always visits him. Out of nowhere, a strange woman falls from a roof and tries to smash the Jedi to the ground, but he dodges, and she smashes into the ground. The strange woman is Maria, from the Order of the Rose. She tells the Jedi that she never thought he would be protecting Pag. She tells him to hand over Pag, and the Jedi does so willingly. He grabs Jaina, and the two of them run off. Then Maria takes off her disguise, and she's wearing the clothes Pag put on her. And now, Maria tells Pag that it's time to put an end to her existence. At that moment, Pag breaks the ropes that bind him, pulls out his camera, 
and starts taking as many pictures as he can. The other members of the Order of the Rose come to support her, and the commander of the Order of the Rose asks why they are on her battle stage. When they told her that the only way to defeat Pag was to distract him by wearing the clothes he gave them, they all agreed to use the clothes to catch Pag off guard and defeat him. And although Maria didn't agree with the idea at first, she eventually gave in. She asks them where their dresses are, and they tell her that it would be too embarrassing for them. Maria is furious with everyone, but turns to Pag, who is still taking photos. She tells the other members that she will stop him, and they must look for a chance to eliminate him. So she heads towards Pag with her hammer, and meanwhile, the Jedi and Jaina are still on the run. Two guards block their path and try to capture them, but the Jedi uses a body enhancement spell to take one of them down. The other gets into a fight with the Jedi, but he uses an acceleration spell to knock him out. The Jedi and Jaina continue, and Jaina is convinced that the Jedi is really a mage. They come across a larger group of soldiers who are determined to capture him. They jump over the walls and escape to the roof, and when they look back to check if they're being followed, they don't see anyone. The Jedi thinks they finally got rid of the soldiers, but a beam of light is thrown in his direction from somewhere in front of him, and he blocks it. The wizard is in front of them, on a higher roof, with a huge magic circle hanging over his head. He tells the Jedi to surrender, because the whole kingdom is hunting him, and he can't escape. Jaina asks him how they're going to escape from so many enemies, and the Jedi shows her a teleportation ring, and tries to explain where the ring teleports to, but Jaina barely lets him explain. She puts the ring on, and they are teleported away from the soldiers. The Kingdom's Wizard then casts a magical tracking spell to see where the Jedi and Jaina have teleported to, but he's not happy with what he sees. Jaina wonders where they are, but suddenly they hear heavy footsteps approaching him. Thus, a monster hidden in the darkness welcomes the Jedi into its lair. The monster approaches the light, and it is a huge red dragon. Jaina is visibly frightened, and the Jedi says hello to the dragon, calling it his master. Jaina is surprised that he has called the dragon his master, and the dragon tells Jaina that since he has returned, he must be ready to receive his punishment. The Jedi asks his master to calm down and have mercy on him, and Jaina just watches as the dragon devours the Jedi. She shouts his name as the dragon devours him, and she wonders why the dragon ate the Jedi since the Jedi is the dragon's disciple. However, the dragon spits out the Jedi, and he is covered in saliva, but his hands and legs are now tied. The red dragon changes into its human form and tells the Jedi that it wants to have a nice chat about that day. The dragon's real name is Riggy Ruggus, and she teleports them to her house, and the Jedi kneels in silence with his arms and legs bound. He looks dejected, and meanwhile, Jaina looks around the house. She can't believe that the red dragon lives in such a beautiful place. Riggy tells the Jedi that she has many questions to ask him, but the first question she asks is about his horn. The Jedi tells her that her horn is well guarded, and that he hasn't done anything with it yet. However, Riggy throws the Vegizo at Jedi to make him tell the truth, and she asks him the question again. He then says that he sold them because he heard that a dragon's horn contains powerful magic. Her horn was sold to a nobleman like a Tony, as it was a much sought-after product. On hearing this, Riggy punches the Jedi repeatedly, asking him why he did such a thing with her horn. Jaina thinks she's being too dramatic, but she also thinks Riggy is very nice. She stops punching Jedi and asks him what his relationship with Jaina is. Once she's asked, she starts punching him again, asking why he left her, and also complains that he's involved with another woman. She keeps punching him, asking him various questions, and Jaina tries to explain the situation, but Riggy starts crying. Crazy legs. She lets go of Jedi and falls to the ground, and now the only thing she wants to know is what happened to him now that he's grown up. When he was a child, he was so adorable, and she wants to know how he grew up to be such a despicable man. She keeps crying, and he tries to console her. Then Jaina asks him if he's a red dragon too, since he's been living with Riggy since he was a child. And the Jedi tells her that he's just an ordinary human who lived with Riggy before becoming a hero. Suddenly, Riggy remembered why the Jedi lost his consciousness. She tells him that he has changed since one day, a certain man persuaded him to become a hero. That day, the Goddle and the Jedi were sitting at a table having lunch, and the Goddle told the Jedi that he should become a hero and defeat the Demon Lord, so that he could save the princess and take her as his bride. At the time, the young Jedi imagined himself as a hero, with the princess in his arms, and he decided to become a hero. He told Riggy about his new plans. Godel, meanwhile, after planting the seed in the Jedi's mind, packed his things and left, thus saving himself from being crushed by Riggy. Back in the present, Riggy scolds him for doing bad things after listening to Godel, going so far as to cut off his horn. In response, the Jedi says that at the time, she agreed to have her horn cut off. However, she didn't imagine that he would do such a thing to her. She tells him that she won't let him out of her sight again because the world is too dangerous and he might have his mind changed again by those random savages pointing at Jaina. Jaina doesn't understand why she's being called a savage, and the Jedi tells her that the world is indeed very dangerous, and that's why he sought her out again. The Jedi tells her that he thought she would bring him back immediately when he left. Then she tells him that she thought he had gone 
gone to Catalan so that he could avoid her, and the Jedi doesn't understand what she means. Then she tells him that he can't go into that kingdom because it's a very strange place. That said, we see the prince wearing a disguise on a rooftop. He looks out over the soulless town square, and he thinks Roque is a fool for refusing his proposal. They walk away while the guards take Roque towards the south. Roque's crimes have been pieced together for the people, and they have gathered to witness his execution. As he walked through the crowd of onlookers, they mocked him, calling him a traitor to the king and a lapdog of the demon lore. They start throwing various things at him, but Roque isn't bothered by any of it. He walks through the crowd calmly, and then a woman steps out of the crowd and into Roque's path as he does some inhaling. Roque looks at her and recognizes her as Gil, his sister. Gil is the eldest sister of the Bacardi family, and she has known how to handle a sword since childhood. Ever since she was little, her dream was to marry a man stronger than her, and at just 15 years old, she managed to defeat all the masters and swordsmen of the generation, and decided to move across the continent to challenge different masters, but none were able to defeat her. For this reason, she is still a 35-year-old bachelorette. You're up to date, bro. You're up to date. Come on, Jedi. Big spear, bro. Come on, Jedi. Wow, Jedi. My God in heaven, Jedi. All I know is that at that moment, one of the guards tells her not to interfere with official duties, and Roque asks her why she came to this square. Just then, another guard discovers that Gil is Roque's older sister, and he tries to warn everyone, but it's too late. A guard ends up being thrown through the air. He hits the wall and is knocked out. The guards and the crowd, who were excited before, now can't understand what's going on. Gil attacks the guards and defeats them all at once. The crowd disperses after this happens. She greets Roque and tells him that he looks very tired. Roque asks what she's doing there, and she says that their father sent her. Roque is surprised and asks her if she was sent to save him, and she takes out her sword and puts it around his neck, and she tells him that their father said that they shouldn't entrust their family's shame to others. Roque then asks if she and their father have forgiven him for joining the Demon Lord's army, and she tells him that their father doesn't care about his choice, because notoriety only raises the family's reputation, good or bad. She tells him that the reason their father won't forgive him is because he lost to the Jedi. She tells him that he has tarnished the family's dignity and asks him if he has any last words to say, and he tells her that since he lost, the demon Lord Claudine is also dead. That's why he doesn't mind dying at his sister's hands. Agil twirls her blade, then cuts the chains from Roque's neck, wrists, and legs, after which she motivates him, saying that he can't abandon his dreams. If demon Lord Claudine is dead, he must lead the demon Lord's army and fulfill Lord Claudine's wishes. She tells him that although he has lost, he now needs to win next time so that he can redeem himself. She reminds him of his identity, and he says that no one can defeat him except her. She encourages him to continue, and he gets teary-eyed. The unit of the Golden Order of Catalan soldiers marches into the square, all of them intent on not letting Roque caper. However, Aguil presents Roque with his sword and tells him to get rid of the guards. Roque defeats all the guards and gets into a hand-to-hand -hand battle with the captain. The captain almost knocks him down, but Roque calmly uses his family blade to blow the captain away. Once this was done, Roque looked at his family's ancestral sword, called the Crimson Tear. He felt honored to be able to use it, and Aguil praises him for easily taking care of the guards. In response, Roque says that it was thanks to this powerful sword, and after hearing this, Aguil tells him to keep it, because he needs it much more than she does. Roque then asks her what she would use to fight, and she shows him a small toothpick, saying that's all she needs. He asks her how she's going to explain to their father that she wasn't able to kill him, so she tells him that it's not the first time she's disobeyed her father's orders. Roque's sister is quite sure that their father probably foresaw what she would do, and that's why he sent her. After hearing this, Roque thanks her for sparing his life, and she tells him to come home if he's tired. She walks away, telling him to remember that he owes her a favor. Now Roque is back, ready to continue Lord Demon Claudine's work. Quickly, Roque walks through the city, confident with the family sword at his hip, confident now that he can defeat any enemy, including the Jedi. Then some suspicious noises come from a glow, and he prepares for an attack. There, he sees that Pag has been captured by the knights. At that moment, they all realize that Roque is standing there, looking at them. Pug asks Roque what he's doing in the city, and Roque tells him that's a story for another day. He tells Pag to follow him back to the Demon Lord's castle because he wants to become a new Demon Lord. Pug asks Roque if he's really planning to fight another war, and Roque just tells him that he's going to fulfill the promise he made to the Demon Lord Claudine and wipe out the entire kingdom of Catalan. But he tells Pag that before that, they need to get Lord Claudine's team back. So Roque goes to Jaina's apartment, and he can feel Lord Claudine's staff through the walls. He enters the building and proceeds to her apartment. He opens the door cautiously, but the apartment is empty, and entering the apartment, he sees a picture of the Jedi on the wall with a knife through it. He removes the knife and recognizes it as Jaina's knife. He turns to Pag, and he tells him that Jaina is the owner of the apartment. Roque is relieved to know that she is safe, and then looks at Claudine's staff and wraps it up in some clothes. After picking up the staff, he looks at a photo 
of Jaina, in which he and Lord Claudine are present. He smiles as he remembers when Lord Claudine first introduced him to Jaina and asked him to be her master swordsman. He also remembered the countless training sessions he put her through to ensure she mastered the art of the sword. And then he remembered the day they took a photo and how Claudine told him they might never get another chance to take that photo. Now Roque is sad that he doesn't know Jaina's whereabouts and Pag tells him that Jaina left with the Jedi and Roque can't believe his ears and Pag tells him that the Catalan forces were chasing the Jedi so he took Jaina and ran. Roque wonders what Jaina is doing with the hero and Pag tells him that although they fought at first they have settled their differences. Pag tells Roque not to worry about Jaina because the Jedi is a nice guy and they get on very well. Then Roque imagines Jaina keeping Jedi and Pag company and he shouts her name. His voice echoes through the sky and Jaina hears a whisper about it from Rey's house. The news of Jaina's escape from the Jedi reaches Rey who is furious and he is also furious that Roque has been saved and that Pag has escaped from the Order of the Rose. Rey feels overwhelmed by the amount of power he has lost by turning against the hero. However, his advisor tells him that this is not the time to feel discouraged and encourages him to act. So Rey decides to act quickly before Prince Rudy appears. Suddenly, Rudy enters the room and asks his father if the issues can now be considered a national crisis. Rey tells him that it's not that serious and that everything is under control. But his advisor asks him if he doesn't realize how serious the problem is. He tells Rey that the four great demons have escaped, the hero has betrayed them, and the forces of the demon lord could attack at any moment. He asks why his protector, the Black Dragon, hasn't shown up yet. Rey, looking terrified, tells the advisor to be quiet. At this, the prince laughs hysterically, and a black mist appears around him. Then a voice tells him to obey the agreement, and the prince transforms into the Black Dragon. He bursts through the roof and lets out a terrifying roar. The advisor points at the dragon, and he tries to form his words, but can't. Rey then tells him that he mustn't say that he saw about it, and draws his sword to make sure that his advisor doesn't get a chance to spread the news. And now, the prince waits for Rey to be ready to fight him. He, in his dragon form, roars, and all the townspeople notice him. Hawk and Pag look at him from the corner of a beautiful, and the black dragon moves quickly towards the red dragon. At Rey's house, she tells Jed to stay in his room and not to go anywhere. Jed is tied up, and he asks Rey to at least untie him. Rey tells him that if she just unties him, he might run away, and now she wants him to stay in her house because he's safe here, and the Catalan soldiers won't dare attack him. Suddenly, a magical barrier is erected around her house, and the black dragon fires a beam of purple energy at Rey. Rey generates a magic circle to block the attack, after which he returns to Jed, asking if he's all right. He tells her that he's fine, although his shield is slowly disintegrating. He tells her that the level of the enemy's attack is too high, so Rey's castle is reduced to rubble, and the black dragon ceases its attack. Rey takes this opportunity to transform into her dragon form and launches herself at the enemy, but he invokes a shield to protect himself. However, Rey crashes into him, and she smashes him to the ground. Immediately afterwards, Rey uses her magic to attack the enemy, creating a huge explosion, and Jane tells Jed that this battle is very terrifying for her. Just then, Jed drinks a potion to restore his health, and he says that Rey is considered a formidable dragon, so she won't lose this battle. He says that most opponents don't survive her first attack, but the enemy rises from the ground, and Rey is shocked to see that he's still alive. The black dragon regenerates and attacks Rey with its teeth, embroidering her shoulder. Rey screams in pain and struggles. She fires a beam of energy that pierces the enemy, but it regenerates again. The enemy dragon uses its shadows to follow her and asks if this is all she has. She frees herself from the bonds and continues firing energy beams at him, but the enemy only regenerates and continues attacking with his shadows. Jana asks Jed how the black dragon is still alive, and Jed thinks his regeneration is unusual. Jana asks him what he plans to do when he says he's going to save Rey. Then Rey says that he thinks the regency has a chance of winning, and since he can't help them win since he's only human, he decides to go rogue and put a certain plan into action. So Jed gives Janna a necklace and asks her to get away as quickly as possible. The enemy is about to say something to him, but then our protagonist teleports into the middle of the fight. Ray asks if he's all right, and our protagonist replies that he is. Jed looks at the black dragon, and he comes to the conclusion that since the enemy can aim at him from so far away, he probably isn't using his normal vision, but detecting his mana. Quickly, the enemy dragon notices Jed and decides to go after him, but Jed teleports away and attends to Riggy's head. He tells Riggy to stay calm and transforms her back into her human form. He takes her in his arms and tells her that there is only one way to escape his tracking. Jed then performs a magical disguise technique and creates several magic transfer circles. Before disappearing, Jed says goodbye to his enemy and vanishes. However, the prince seems to be interested in the game of hide-and-seek, believing in his power to detect mana and find it. He knows that Jed can't hide from him. At this, we see Jed appearing near Yana, who really was running away according to his orders. He knocks Riggy down, tells her not to move, and cuts off her second
second horn. Yana is shocked by the drop in Riggy's magical power, and the red dragon picks up his horn all sad. She screams in frustration, asking why he has done this and that. Because of this, she no longer has any magical power. Then Jed tells Janne that they were being tracked by the enemy, and by hiding Riggy's magic, he made the enemy think that they had broken through their barrier. At this, Riggy says that she can hide her power, but Jed says that she can't use her conventional methods, that her power is too intense. In the end, the enemy turns back into the prince, and his barrier disintegrates, and the prince wonders why Jed and Riggy ran away instead of putting him out of his misery. After that, we see that Rocky is now back. As the demon lord of the castle, he puts on some clothes and enters the throne room, where other people are waiting for him.